So if we were to take, and you're familiar with the dynamic disk designs models, the uh, great artist, the owner uh, who develops all of these, Jerome Fryer, took a lot of the initial uh, models from our work uh, at the university. And he captured in the most biofidelic way uh, what we were able to measure over the years. So just as a knee loses stability and stiffness uh, with injury, so do spinal joints. So consider this joint, L3-4 normal, and this joint, L5-S1 normal, but L4-5 has lost a bit of stiffness, observe. I'm going to apply a torque back and forth and you can see where the majority of the emotion occurs, where the joint has lost stiffness. If we turn around, you can see which facet joints are getting worked. Again, it's the joint. So not always, but almost always, if it's a non-traumatic injury, you will see the facets become clinical two or three years post disc injury. Very rarely is it a disc is is the disc secondary to facet damage. It does occur, but it's very rare. Um, nonetheless, there is the first tenant of spine stability. Injury causes instability uh, and pain. And then if you uh, you could assess that through a frontal plane prone shear instability test, which is the drawer test for spines. You could do a frontal plane uh, bear hug kind of a, a stability test where you push their shoulders hooking down uh, and posting as the clinician and pulling the opposite iliac crest across and seeing if you can create the pain laterally. But the beauty of this, this style of provocative testing is immediately you can find the antidote. You could ask the person, try some abdominal bracing, stiffen the abdominal wall, allow the stiffness of the muscles, <clears throat> excuse me, make up for the joint loss of stiffness, arrest the micro movements, try the uh, offensive shear test once again, and, and quite often they say, oh, my pain is gone or it's less. So there is the first type uh, of stability in the context of uh, injury. A disc uh, obviously is not a ball and socket joint. There's a disc, which is a concentric ring architecture of collagen fibers. The collagen fibers are held together with a gooey stuff called ground substance. The middle of the disc is a gel and it is an incompressible hydraulic fluid. There it is. And if you have, so I said, the collagen forms a fabric. It's a biological adaptable fabric. My shirt is a fabric too. My beautiful Alico lifting jacket. <laughs> I'll, I'll put a word in for one of the sponsors of BackFit Pro <laughs> here. If I wanted to work the fibers loose and create a hole in my jacket, I'd create stress strain reversals back and forth and the weave would delaminate and open up. That's what people do when they start treating their spines like ball and socket joints. The collagen fibers with motion plus load, you need both. If I, if I did cat camel or, or uh, Middle Eastern belly dancing all day long, we've never measured any uh, issues with that. The problem is when you take the spine through the range of motion under load, that's when the delamination stresses occur. And there has been a little bit of a delamination through the collagen here. So when I pressurize the nucleus, I can work the gel through the delamination and you will, there it is. Do you see the bubble starting to come up yeah, now yeah, we can as see the yeah. nucleus works its way uh, through? So there is a fabric and I'm just going to, uh, everyone can see the weave. If I do some stress strain reversals, you can start to see how already I started to delaminate the uh, fabric. So if we then go to a, uh, another one of uh, Dynamic Disc Design's brilliant models, you can see the gel down inside the nucleus. And if we look around posteriorly, you will see a delamination that has occurred. At the end of my finger right there, can you see a little bit of a red mark? Yep. That is a delamination. So now I'm going to squeeze the spine and bend it forward. 
which puts hydraulic effort posteriorly through the delamination, and then we can see the disc bulge starting. Yeah. I have a friend who's a radiologist who has one of these in his neck, and he does this for about 15 minutes. We take an MRI picture. There's the nice juicy disc bulge. He goes the other way, and I'll pull a little bit of a vacuuming traction on his neck. 15 minutes later, it's gone. <laughs> so there are certain disc bulges that we can have almost a spontaneous resolution with the right amount of mechanical knowledge, uh, the disc shape, for example, uh, the more limacon or the more it's shaped like a lima bean, the easier it is to get uh, resolution of the disc bulge. But then this is what happens. The next time the person bends forward, uh, either performing a poor uh, form squat in the gym, or they might, some people are even just tying their shoe, or they might sneeze and cause the disc bulge to grow. Um, bending forward, and you can see the bulge growing. Now, this time, I'm going to apply the mechanical antidote. We're going to stack the spine, and I'm going to bend forward through the hips. You can take a lot of compression now, and I'm just going to compress. Notice nothing comes out of the delamination. You have to bend forward and drive the hydraulic effort posteriorly with posture. So posture is key in that type of uh, disc bulge. So that's one way, uh, almost always associated with lifting poorly. If we had a uh, very flexible athlete, say someone like a yoga practitioner, and they didn't lift weights, interesting, when they bend forward, their disc bulge is anterior or to get a posterior bulge, they have to arch backwards. So it's the opposite response because their discs have adapted great flexibility and they're not delaminated. So do you see how, again, how the disc was adapted by its owner determines uh, the disc bulge and the disc damage. Another pathway though, is through the top and bottom of the disc. Consider the vertebra as a barrel and the top and bottom of the barrel is a cartilaginous end plate. It's not bone as people think. So now I'm going to squeeze this specimen, pressurize the nucleus inside the disc, and now we've cut the top of uh, the cut the vertebra off. But notice how the end plate squeezes up into the vertebral body. And the vertebral body is not solid bone, it's spongy bone, cancellous bone. And those struts or trabeculae of bone have a spring, uh, a leaf spring action to them. But they, the, this, this uh, breach in the cartilaginous uh, end plate allows the nucleus to come through and push into breaking some of the struts. And that's called the Schmorl's node. Uh, or, and the inflammation response to the immune system seeing the nucleus come through into the blood for the first time because the nucleus is, is avascular, it doesn't have blood supply. But as that uh, nuclear material comes up into the bloody environment, it sets off a massive inflammatory response. And then you see the modic changes on MRI, which is uh, inflammation inside the bone. And it feels like a bone pain. So when the person says, oh, I've got they can put their finger on it right there. I've, I've got um, uh, just a central boring pain and I'll say, good, grab the stool, pull up on the stool, add some compressive load and I'll say, that's what really triggers my pain. So now we're suspecting a, uh, uh, an end plate fracture. Uh, when you let a little air out of your car tire, it bulges on the road. And the car is also a little bit sloppy. Uh, that's what happens when you get an end plate fracture. The whole disc bulges now, and it's not a focal disc bulge, which I've been talking about up until this point. It's a broad-based bulge because the whole joint is now flatter, and the disc just bulges everywhere. Not only does it bulge outward, but it bulges inwards as well. And over the longer term, that may be a bit more of a problematic uh, clinical situation. 
anyway, there's a little bit of a start uh, or essay on uh, disc injuries. Yeah, again, so so rich, there's so much in that. And I think it's great to actually, you know, be able to visualize it, which is why um, I'm a big fan of, of those uh, dynamic disc designs as well. I think, you know, we'll touch on it a little bit later, but being able to actually educate patients on that so they actually, you know, know their mechanism um, is so empowering. Um, and I think it's huge as well to go on that. Um, and so if I took... Uh, another one of uh, Jerome's fabulous dynamic disc designs. Here is a uh, specimen with a bilateral fracture of the pars. You can see the pars is broken right there. And how does that happen? It occurs, you see the facet joints moving past one another, creating stress strain reversals. Gymnasts, if, if I said to you, who has spondylolisthesis, you would say, gymnasts, dancers, and up until a few years ago in Australia, we would say fast bowlers and cricket as well. Uh, but that's another story. But the stress strain reversals of the pars bone, full range flexion through to full range extension. Uh, I see it in gymnastics, uh, et cetera. Over and over and over again, a stress crack forms at the bottom of the pars. And if you keep up the offense, the stress crack continues with more cumulative trauma until it breaks all the way through bilaterally, it breaks off and now they've lost contact with the whole spinous process and the superior vertebra often slips forward like this on the uh, inferior. So it is a cumulative trauma fracture 